for about, um, all they wanted was a dollar. Now a 1901 dollar today is $29, but what they also got was pretty imaginative, was this, the trolley runs on electricity. Trolley company, in 1901, there probably weren't a lot of homes in Surrey that were running on electricity. We'll let you go through our property. You gotta give us the right to take electricity off your lines and we'll pay you only what you pay the power company. So these people worked out a good deal too. They were on DC, wasn't it? I think so. The uh, Humphrey Owens estate. A little over $8,000. The uh, Hughes estate, or the Hughes property, uh, some more good bartering. Had to move the house and woodshed. 300 feet from its present location, build another cellar, put it, uh, you know, a cistern in, rebuild the chimney. Why not? From the, from the cellar bottom. All had to be done by October 15th. This next guy, $8,000. Mr. Visor, which was pretty much across from or close to, you see here, oops, it's the border between New Hartford and Kirkland. This is pretty much across the street from uh, Gilroy Kernan and Gilroy used to be the Central New York Academy of Medicine, I think. So he got about $11,000. Mr. Williams here, he struck a hard bar bargain too, $14,000. And this, uh, the Pagan Farm, uh, they, they struck a hard deal too, $21,000. They needed to maintain a fence and ditches, kind of standard things, but also something a little different was cattle guards between the rails. Some of you who've been out west have probably seen those before. And cattle fences, which unfortunately for cows 15 years later didn't do much good because the trolley, besides running over Mr. Fitzgerald, it also one December night ran into a herd of cows at this location, killing two of them. So, but despite all this mayhem, uh, the trolley was, uh, was welcomed by the community. So, Jim, at this point, we're going to, if you can get up here and help us, sure. help me, please, we'll yeah. enter into the... Now, the trolley went on a dead end. How did it get back here? It looped around here at the green. No, I don't mean that. It went to a dead end. How did it get back here? Well, there really weren't any dead ends. There were dead ends on the two line. On where? On the line. There were dead ends on the line. Well, I'm not aware of any. Perhaps there were, but the, the line was single track from the Anadasa's golf course right up here to Clinton. It looped around the uh, uh, the village green, and uh, and the, the, they could reverse direction too by reverse it, moving the pole on the top of the trolley. Right. So if they were stuck in one location, by it was easy for them just to go the other way. Right. So. Okay, which one we're going to click on? The, uh, that, yep. Clinton Trout Live, a lot of enthusiasm, formal hoping to occur. The village has been the scene of unusual activity. The streets have been thronged with residents and country people who drove in to see the opening of the trolley line between here and here. Everything connected with the formal opening was entirely satisfactory, and the brightness of the day added much to the occasion. The first car left Utica at 12 o'clock with General Manager John J. Stanley, officials of the road, and Berger's full band on board. Mr. Stanley also had as his guest Village President Theodore T. Thompson, and members of the Board of Trustees, members of the Town Board, Proprietor Sticks of the Worth House, Postmaster F. E. Payne, C. D. Larrabee, and General Smythe, as well as representatives of the Utica Papers and Clinton Courier and Advisor. The Clinton people had gone to Utica on the 1120 train. The trip to this village was made in 45 minutes, the exact scheduled time. When the car reached the new track of west of New Hartford, Motorman Dotty permitted electricity to perform some pretty energetic work with the apparent backward speeding of electric poles, fence posts, and trees 
gave a strong impression to his passengers that they must be going along with some. The band got off at the foot of the park and escorted the car around playing martial music. As the car arrived during the noon hour, the school children helped them enlighten matters by their presence in large numbers. Manager Stan Lee and his guests alighted and proceeded to the Worth House where a fine banquet was served. The railroad official came the house. About 25 sat down. The first car for Utica left here at 1 o'clock, well filled, and the regular schedule of a car leaving every hour has been maintained during the afternoon. The passengers are enthusiastic over the accommodations afforded them by the travel. Note, under Clint notes in the same edition of the Sentinel, not all bystanders were thrilled about trolleys coming into the village. Headline, first runaway caused by trolley cars. The first serious runaway caused by the trolley cars occurred this morning. Ned Plunkett was driving along South Park Road with one of Hoot's delivery rigs when he met the work car rounding the curve at the bend of the park. The horse, a spirited one, took fright and broke into a run. In front of the Kennedy building, the wagon slowed, and striking a pile of dirt, Plunkett was thrown out, striking on the frozen ground with great force, bruising his hip and giving him a bad shakeup. The horse made a break up Fountain Street and was caught halfway up the chestnut without having any damage been done. Motorman, brother to optimism, high sting of wife's death by attempting to cheer passengers with long faces. Monotonous? Sometimes, but I enjoy it, says Scotty, pilot in Hartford's trolley. A lady! Lady! The woman had just stepped off the new Hartford streetcar. She looked around with an annoyed expression clouding her countenance. What is it? She snapped. You didn't put in your fare, remonstrated the conductor. And you know, I gotta have something to remember you by. It was Frederick O. Scott, Leeds Street, better known as Scotty, who has the new Hartford run. Businessmen, stenographers, in fact, almost everybody who rides on the New Hartford line have come to know Scotty and like him. The motorman seems to be a full brother in optimism. It is a rare occasion when no jovial smile is flashing across his face. That smile is contagious. Men with grouches climb the steps of his conveyance and set on carrying their grouches into the office. A pleasant word from Scotty, a glimpse of his smile perhaps, and the icy grouch melts quickly away. Stenographers wait to their place of employment run down the side streets waving at Scotty. The trolley waits just a second while the girls reach the step. Perhaps the furnace went out. Maybe the baby cried all night and Mr. and Mrs. may have had a spat at the breakfast table. Whatever it is that happened, it brings young Mr. Utica to his morning streetcar ride with a face much longer than it is wide. Cheer up, young man, Scotty will say. The young man, for some reason or another, does cheer up and temporarily, at least, forgets his woes. Riding up and down one street all day would get pretty monotonous, a person might think. Scotty does not find it so. There are so many people who nod and say, hello. All of Scotty's cheerfulness is pretty much a bluff to hide a sting that has hurt his heart since his wife died about a year ago, he says. I laugh and smile, he told me yesterday, but it is more or less forced. While I'm out on the job, I feel it is my duty to cheer folks up, but much of the time since my pal has gone, I've been down in the dumps. The people along the line have been mighty nice to him and have extended their sympathy, he says. Some of the best folks in Utica ride in this trolley, he said. I'm glad I have this run as they can ride with me. The motorman has been operating the New Hartford trolley up and down Genesee Street for nearly 13 years. He has about 20 consecutive years of service with the New York State Railways. Doesn't it get pretty tiresome going up and down the same street, he was asked. Well, he countered, it's just like any other job. No matter how well you like it, there will be days when you seem to be tramping along in a deep rut. But it is a pleasant occupation, and I enjoy it. The trolley slowed to a stop, and Scotty bent down to give his hand to a little schoolgirl carrying an armful of books. Well, little one, you were so small I nearly didn't see you. The little girl is one of hundreds of Uticans that Scotty's helping hand of optimism helps him cheer through the troubles of the day. A simple little shed had prominent beginning. There is a simple stucco shed alongside Route 5 in New Hartford that poses something of a mystery for the keen-eyed observer. 
An inconspicuous sign identifies it as a bus stop, yet no transportation company owns it. The walls are always freshly painted and nestled along carefully tended flowers. There's never a weed in sight. Generations of nighttime travelers have passed it almost unheedingly, yet it is brightly lit with a single electric bulb. During its more than 50 years at the corner of Cheryl Brook and Route 5, the shed has seen the country day school disappear and the Utica Mutual Insurance Company rise in the distance. The shelter's area of bus ride from sun and snow just as it did their parents when the Utica Clinton trolley tracks ran past its doorway. It also has the distinction of being designed by one of the nation's most prominent architects, the late Clement R. Newkirk. Newkirk, who died at age 80 last July, was the man who designed Faxton Hospital, Rome Hospital, and the Niagara Mohawk Power Corporation building at 258 Genesee Street. His buildings also graced the campuses of Cornell, Colgate, Hamilton, St. Lawrence, and Clarkson Institute of Technology. Then why a simple shed? The answer lies a few hundred yards east on Cheryl Brook. Behind the bushes stand three houses designed at the same time. The main house, the one nearest Route 5, gave Newkirk the inspiration for his trolley shelter. This is the home built for Mr. and Mrs. Richard U. Sherman in English domestic style. There is a high peaked roof, dormer windows, and casement window below. Oak and woodwork is prominent throughout, and snowberry bushes line the outer walls where the lush green lawn ends. Newkirk explained at the time that his goal was to make the buildings a part of the land he was working with. Mrs. Sherman took the idea to heart, and she alone keeps the shed in its well-kept state. It was built for maids and gardeners, she recalls, but there are no more of those nowadays. The light now burns for travelers and to help friends and delivery men find her driveway. You'd be amazed at how much traffic we get back here, she says, and indeed one would, for Shellbrook is a dead-end street. Since the property is between the township and village of New Hartford, nobody has put street lights up. Very simply put, Mrs. Sherman says she cares for the shed because if she did not, nobody else would. The side windows, for example, were once lined with glass. The panes were replaced many times, but nature and nature's young boys kept knocking them out. The trolley stop will never rank as Newkirk's most famous work, but it's a labor of love. It was his idea from the start, Mrs. Sherman recalls. Newkirk graduated from the Cornell School of Architecture in 1907 and was a partner in Bag and Newkirk of Utica until he retired in 1951. He served as a consultant in architectural history to the Munson Williams Proctor Institute from 1951 to 56 and once served as a director of the American Institutes of Architects. So the next time you drive along Route 5, you may find it worthwhile to pause for a moment and study the shed. It is an enduring example that no job is too insignificant if it's a labor of love. David H. Beaton, a Hamilton College graduate, reporter, and columnist for the Utica newspapers, and later the Gannett News Service, wrote in a June 30th, 1946 column that the Clinton trolley, as those who have written it will recall, was the forerunner of the airplane. We get a good hint at Mr. Beatle's point in an article titled, Traveling on Trolley Car to Clinton Provides All Thrills of Ride on Horse, under the pseudonym of A. Jocelyn Ryder, which appeared in the Observer Dispatch on Tuesday, November 5th, 1935, when abandonment of the Clinton Trolley Line was a mere four and a half months away. A horse pecking will go, and not on a four-legged critter either, one of those huge eight-wheeled steel horses that used to zip between Rome and Little Falls on the trolley line. And the trail we will follow is not over hill and dale, but on that wandering ribbon of iron, the Clinton streetcar line. We envy a heavy-set woman holding her position so sedately up front, for we immediately gave up the idea of even reading the newspaper. In the middle of a holstered seat, we rolled in somewhat uneven rhythm from side to side like a girl on a circus horse dancing the two-step. It wasn't so bad going slow, and he didn't even mind the ups and downs so familiar to horsemen. But when the big car hit 20 miles per hour or better, it was figured that it was time to begin holding on. The gentle side roll became a series of sharp lurches with no certainty for which direction we were headed. It's quite a sensation riding that several miles between New Hartford and Clinton. The reason for the equestrian sensations is to be found in the roadbed, which the New York State Railways has been seeking permission from the villages of Clinton and New Hartford to abandon. 
The roadbed appears to have almost outlived its usefulness, and unless the permission is granted, it's anticipated that the New York State Railways will have to rebuild it from New Hartford to Clinton. The ties are old and weather-worn, and some of them are returning to pieces so badly that it does not seem possible that they could hold spikes securely. This makes the track uneven and loose joint. Under the circumstances, the trolley company is doing all it can to remedy the situation. The biggest and easiest riding cars and forest park barns are operating over on the Clinton line. If they weren't, that woman who sits in her seat so rigidly up front so often might have to learn how to sprawl on the floor gracefully. Workmen are now strengthening the roadbed near stop five and a half. Rumors are current that a group of citizens plan to object to the substitutions under the ground that the cars are easier riding than the buses. The Clinton Village Board will meet Friday night to consider the company's petition to substitute buses for the trolley line. The company some time ago offered to abandon the line and apply to the Public Service Commission for a certificate of operation of buses. If this granted, that will mean the suspension of service on the only remaining interurban trolley line running out of Utica. The New Hartford cars would continue to operate from the loop. The Utica, Clinton, and Binghamton Railroad, which the New York State Railways leases the right of way to Clinton, has agreed to the substitution. The last trolley began its nine mile run to Clinton from Utica at 11.45 p.m. on Saturday, March 21, 1936. It departed to Clinton about an hour later, very early on Sunday morning, March 22nd. As mentioned by Robert Early in his book, Here Comes the Trolley, the motorman at the start of the return trip to Utica said, We ought to make some noise. So the chime whistle lasted a salute as the trolley left Clinton forever. Columnist David H. Beadle was aboard, and his article chronicling the trolley's last run appeared in Monday, March 23rd, 1936 edition of the Utica Daily Press. We have always wondered what happened when a trolley company ran its very last car over any given line. Saturday night and early Sunday morning, we found out. It just runs the trolley car, and that's all there is to it. No high officials, no brass bands, no laurel wreaths. They just run the car. And if we are to judge by what motorman R.J. Bliss said, get it over with as soon as possible. Anyway, along with the motorman, we were the only passengers to get on the 11.45 Saturday night at the Main Street Barn and make a complete circuit. We rode with the intention of making a full log of the trip for posterity, or at least our Monday morning readers. We got off to an excellent beginning by noting that two other passengers boarded at the start of the run, a man in a gray felt hat and a short, immaculately dressed man with a shiny-handled umbrella, derby, and silk scarf who ran out rather excitedly when it looked for a moment as though the car might leave. Well, our log, as an accurate and complete account, didn't get much farther than that. We did note at a risky street that a couple got on, and the man, bareheaded, and the woman in the peacock blue hat. The man asked, is this the last one up? And I'm being told, yes, and said, well, that's the one we want. <coughs> then a swarm of persons, mostly we gathered, Hamilton College students, crowded to at the busy corner, and our log gets partly confused, since at Columbia Street, the car was detained by fire apparatus, which added to the confusion. Nevertheless, it was an auspicious start, or was it, to think of the last Clinton run being held up by fire engines. Just this once, couldn't they let the Clinton car go first, give it one last fling? But we got firemen on sentimental. They scooted across right in front of us. A block further or two, boys that had gotten on the busy street corner got out to chase the fire engines, as if the engines could ever be as important as the last clean car. Well, we climbed up Genesee Street without much of the moment occurring. At one time, there were more than 25 people aboard, but when we left to Hartford, the number had dwindled to 11. There was no sign that anything momentous was taking place. One youth blurted, Is this the maiden voyage? when he got on. To most of the passengers, it seemed just another Clinton car. All very sad. At Clinton, everybody got out, but three other passengers. They stayed on. Then we knew who the thoroughbreds were. The others were just passengers that wanted to go to Clinton. A bus or an auto would have gotten them there just as well, but not these three. They obviously, or pretty obviously, went because it was the last car and they wanted to be on it. We tackled the immaculately dressed man about it first, the man we told him at the start. He beamed jovially. I'm a foreman for the company, he said. 
I helped build this roadbed more than 30 years ago. I just had to go on that last car. It developed, his name is C.J. Jones, and he lives in Whitesboro. He used to live in Clinton. And when they first built the line, he obtained work driving a team. He helped haul spikes, ties, and things. And later he worked for the Utica Gas and Electric Company, but for 30 years he has been with the railways. I was to go out to Clinton tonight with the family and visit him, he told us. They thought we'd wait and come in on the last car, but we didn't. When we got to Utica, the family went home, but I just couldn't help waiting for the last car. There's a sentiment to it when you're a railway man. We agreed with Mr. Jones, but couldn't see that many railway men thought so. At least if they did, they weren't present to prove it. Next, we advanced to the other two, the young man and the woman who we told you got on at a risky street. Well, they were over at Hotel Martin for the evening. The man, who told me his name was H.F. Penner, said he read in the paper about the last car to Clinton and thought it would be good fun to ride on it, something to tell one's grandchildren about. His friend apparently thought so too, but she withheld her name from posterity. She will have to go down in history as the unidentified woman in the peacock blue hat, the only woman who rode on the last trolley from Glenn. Also on the homeward trip was Robert G. Gurney from Hartford. He took two flashlight pictures of the car as it arrived in Clinton, said he wanted them for the Brill, people who managed to manufacture the car body and who also published a Brill magazine. He too plans to write about it. Two others got on and route for apparently practical rather than sentimental reasons, and in Utica and other, Lewis Jones, station master at Forest Park. Mr. Jones seemed gratified to know that he was riding in the last Clinton car, but indicated that he hadn't gotten out of his way for it. The motorman stopped and dutifully turned both the switches going back, but we couldn't see much use in it. Maybe he did it more or less automatically, or just to keep the record straight. If we had been the motorman, we would have gotten an English delight in running right by the switch. At the busy corner, everybody got out, including the Mr. Jones of Whitesboro, but not before he told us that he had backed the last Rome's Little Cars Falls in the Forest Park Barns after his final trip. And it gives a railway man a funny feeling to do that, he said. Particularly me. I was always a trolley man, and it seems too bad to see them going. We got off at the station. The motorman gave me his name and said he had been on the job since 1913. This was his regular run from Clinton. That's an actual, that is the actual uh, picture that was taken the last run. How many cars did they have? Just one car? Or were there, were there more than one? Well, they had a lot more than, in the end they had 13 cars they were using on the Clinton line. They were cars that were used from Rome to Little Falls, and when that line was abandoned, they put them on the Clinton line. Okay, but the Clinton line had how many going at the, because you said there was one train an hour, right? Yeah. One. So I don't know, I don't know how many cars the company had all together at the yeah, end. Yeah, but it wasn't one going down and back. And, oh yeah, it was the same one, it would go at 6 o'clock. Oh, it was. Yeah. yeah. That's my question, yeah. yeah. That's right, it's the one car. Any intro to this, John, or just roll? No, nope, just go ahead. This is the drone video. Just can you hit the full screen? Oh. 